My name is Donna Dunlop. This is the kickoff event for this year's Hopkinton Reads uh, Initiative. And this year, as uh, many of you who are part of this library community know, we are commemorating the U.S. getting into World War I, and we are actually part of a regional initiative called Over the Year, over, yeah, over the Year, not very uh, musical. Over there, over here, uh, and historical societies and libraries are doing World War I related <coughs> programs uh, all over the region. So I've been looking for excuses to bring T.J. Wheeler to the library for some time. We've heard good things about him from other libraries, um, and I actually he sang at friend's wedding, yeah, and they, they're still married 30 still years married. later, and, and they said the band was good, so I thought we should bring him here. So I called T.J. up, and I said, do you know World War I songs? And he said, do I know World War I songs? And he was very pleased to be asked about that, and really, I think this was what got you to put together the program specific to this. I'll go with that. You'll go with that. Yeah, All right. That yeah. good. It's, it's never good to, to contradict the person no, who's introducing no. you. No. Yeah. Uh, this program is brought to you thanks to the Hopkinton Library Foundation, which really supports all of the wonderful, most of the wonderful programming that we have here at the library. We are very lucky. T.J. Okay. Wheeler performs all, I'm not gonna let you sing, am I? No, no. He, he has performed on five yeah. continents. He's clock. won Keep awards. Going. Um, and he per performs in schools and communities all over the country. But we're lucky to have him here in New England. Um, without you. further ado, T.J. Wheeler. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Pardon me. Uh, uh, can you uh, run that for me? Sure. Okay, that, that would be great. You can just keep it right there for okay. right at the moment. I'll just, this is kind of working with this uh, PowerPoint <coughs> that, I, that I arranged. Uh, when I realized uh, that this was the centennial of World War I, at least as far as uh, America goes, uh, I was uh, really uh, down with that because I concentrated mostly on blues and jazz and early African American folk music, spirituals, and 1917, those early teen years, mid-teen years were uh, really uh, pivotal uh, to many, many things that I already do on a, on a daily basis when I'm talking about the history of jazz and blues and its early roots as, uh, as popular music. And uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, swing music in Dixieland, New Orleans jazz, we're gonna be including uh, a lot of those things. Uh, to me, uh, World War I is, uh, I'm just going to kind of let, let the music uh, speak for itself. I'm uh, going to do some songs and give you some information. Uh, to me, it's, it's really uh, the war itself. I don't know about, about you, but uh, to me, was uh, really a uh, uh, quagmire and uh, in analysis with the hindsight of a hundred years ago, there's a lot of lot of different. It's kind of a hung jury, you might say, on the on that war. Uh, a lot of people have strong feelings about it, and a lot of people just basically are kind of confused by it. Kind of like the War of 1812, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I'm going to start off with a uh, an old George Cohen number. Uh, over there, all right? And this is some of the uh, patriotic songs that were trying to uh, rev up America into uh, getting into the war. Once we finally committed to it, the war started. Uh, the war had already been going on for uh, a couple of years. And uh, Wilson, President Wilson, he pretty much ran on a, a on a policy that he was going to keep America out of the war, and but uh, he changed his spots on that, and once he did, hmm, well, we'll be exploring that. But uh, here's one of those songs that really uh, was uh, trying to get America ribbed up for it, and it certainly is a. Uh, 
full of reverie. feeling going here, yeah, like a, a little hand clapping, you know? James Cagney uh, made a movie that he was uh, playing uh, George Cohen, so that's interesting. Here's, here's another one of those uh, pretty much uh, pro-war songs. But this song, let's see, uh, let's scroll down just a, a little bit here. Yeah. More? Oh, no, that's fine. Now, uh, like I said, uh, uh, Wilson, uh, to get elected, really ran on a pretty uh, progressive uh, ticket uh, and policies, and those are some of the, the many uh, things that he did that helped uh, win along with that agenda that uh, a lot of people appreciated. And when I first heard about President Wilson, I always heard that he was basically my first impression of him, based on what people were telling me, that he was a very liberal and very progressive president. But we're gonna we'll find out more as we go along. Okay? All right. And also when I heard that he was uh, that he had started uh, wanted to uh, do the League of Nations. Wow, I said, man, well, that's a, that's a pretty insightful, visionary thing. So, uh, let's see, you can uh, scroll up a little bit now if you'd like to. And, like, this is just like little footprints that I'm putting up there. That was his 14-point uh, uh, plan uh, towards the end of the war to uh, try to uh, get uh, everything going back again, which was, uh, you see, 14 was the creation of the Association of Nations, the League of Nations. Um, okay, now, now, now we're getting here. Now we're getting there. Uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, has anybody heard of the Harlem Hellfighters before? Mm -hmm. 
okay, uh, a few people, uh, that, is, that is cool. Uh, the Harlem Hellfires, let me put it this way. If you saw the true story of the Harlem Hellfighters, you would think, this cannot be true. You, this is, oh, this is a bad movie, because this is totally unrealistic. This just couldn't happen. Uh, but it did. The Harlem Hellfighters, uh, the 369th Division, they were all uh, uh, people of color, black troops, and they wanted to fight. But they did not only, well, a certain part of the band, uh, of the regiment, didn't only want to fight, they wanted to play. They wanted to play music, because they were an entire jazz band. And the leader of the jazz band was this guy named James Reese, kind of coincidentally, his last name was Europe. And, and he was already, and the band was already very, very popular. 1917, we got to remember, this is just the beginning of the popularity of jazz music. Jazz and blues. And people were just starting really to uh, make records and distribution was just starting to happen. But little of that had trickled down over in Europe. And so, this band, this army, you know, you, when I think of people entertaining the troops, I always go back to all those Bob Hope specials that I grew up on, right? You know, with Anne Margaret and uh, various different people. That was pretty good. I thought that was pretty cool of uh, Mr. Hope going over there, you know. I'm sure the troops uh, appreciated a, a lot of that. Not casting any flies on that by any means. But the Harlem Hellfighters, they went to fight. But when they weren't fighting, they had instruments in their hands instead of machine guns. And at one point, they, they fought well over 100 days in a row, which, you know, basically three months without a single break, and it was the longest time in that war's history of, of any regiment doing that. Of course, when they first entered the army, they wanted to put them on latrine duty, right? They wanted to put them on like just uh, the worst, most minimal, uh, uh, the, the worst jobs possible that nobody else wanted to do. In other words, like, what was happening in the Deep South and many other places in our, in our country at that time. And uh, just to describe those conditions, I think I'll do a Big Bill Brunsey song. Now, Big Bill Brunsey, even when President Obama got inaugurated, one of the ministers that had spoken during the inauguration actually used some of this song. And uh, it's called White, Brown, and Black.
was a white man, this is what it meant. He was a million dollar and I, I was only making 50 cents. If you're white, yes, I'm a ride. Yes, I'm brown, you can stick around. Everybody stood in line They called everybody's number But they never called mine They said if you want It'll be alright If you're brown You can stick around But if you're black Oh brother Well get back, get back, get back This is my favorite, favorite verse right here well, My old friend Gene Son Thomas would say This is the true verse Wars with my speed and hope, but now I wanna know what you're gonna do about Jim Crow. If you're white, you're alright. If you're brown, you can stick around. But if you're black, oh brother, they say get back, get back, get back. They say get back, get back, get back. ready to do no latrine duty for the next few years. Uh -uh, this is not what they came for. And so the generals in, the, in their uh, wisdom, what they did was they, they sent them over to fight with the French because the French didn't have any segregation laws. The army had segregation laws, right? And, and uh, for the most part, they weren't allowed to fight. Now, in the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps, wanted, in World War I, wouldn't allow blacks in it, period. And in the Navy, during World War I, just relatively very few. But in the Army, they, they were allowed, but they were definitely put on the, the gopher duties. So, the, uh, the French requested reinforcements so, you know, Wilson, when he finally got into this war, got us into this war, he wanted, because the war had been kind of supposedly kind of at a stalemate, he said, we're going to go in there and it's going to be huge. <laughs> huge. Three weeks. We're going to wipe out. No, no, wait a minute. Never mind. I got the wrong. Bizarre. Uh, we're going to go in there and we're with such force, undeniable force, we're not going to take our men, we're not going to take orders from the French, from the British, the Italians. No. Well, we're going to go in there. So when the treaties are is made, we're going to be the ones that are going to be arbitrating that. And we're be the one that's slicing up the pie of Africa and Australia and many other places to turn them into colonial powers. All right, the French will get, we'll give you Algiers, okay? And we'll take this and that. And he wanted to be the guy that's cutting up the pie, you know? Just like eating, like a, serving everybody ice cream and you getting two dishes, you know? You know, something like that, you know, the same type of philosophy. And, uh, but, so the, the general, they didn't really want to help the French so much because they wanted to be, without question, the people that came in on the charging end with the white horses and white sheets. So, no, no, that, we'll get back to that. Uh, charging in with the white horses and, uh, and making sure that we were the, heat, the real saviors of the war. And so when they gave the black troops to the French to, to fight, it, they weren't particularly thinking they were doing them a real favor. As it turned out, the Harlem Hellfighters won 
more or uh, right up there with the top of any other fighting regiment as far as decorations and valor and, and everything. But the first thing the generals did before they even picked up a gun is they made sure they set a policy with all the, the French generals and everybody. And they said, well, this is how, this is how you have to treat the Harlem Hellfighters. Make sure you never compliment them in front of any of the other troops. Make sure that they don't fraternize with any French women. Have, you know, uh, really uh, put them on the, on the worst details. In other words, treat them just like they were being treated because they wanted them to feel right at home. Isn't that nice of them? You know? And so, uh, but that's not what happened. The, 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 the heroics of the Harlem Hellfighters got them so many awards and they were treated so good because that was the, one, the, the worst thing America was afraid of was that they would be treated so good that when they came home, they'd want the same kind of respect. That was the most thing that they were afraid of. This, this is all facts, by the way, not a minimum of opinion. You can't, you gotta have a little opinion in there, you know? You know, uh, oh yeah, and if, uh, we'll get to uh, the Sedition Acts in a little while. But right now, let's have a, a little music of the Harlem Hellfighters, because in addition to entertaining, in addition to being the most heroic or right up there with any other, no matter what color, what ethnic background, very, at the very top of the, of the fighting squads there, the Harlem Hellfighters also introduced jazz to all of Europe, or to a lot of Europe, all right? And so I'll do a little bit of a jazz. They, they like the guy named uh, W.C. Handy a lot. I'll do uh, one of his songs. Oh, on a apron string 
out into the spirit. I recorded some songs uh, to try to, once again, try to psych the Americans up for this fight. Hmm. Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking, said it's wifely duty. Are peaceful and calm. The boys will soon be back on the farm. Reuben, Reuben started waking and slowly rubbed his chin. He pulled the chair up close to his mother and asked her, Where's our friend? She said, How you go to keep the How you gonna keep them away from the liquor Jazzing around, painting the town How you gonna keep him away from harm That's a mystery They never wanna take a rake or, or a plow Who the deuce can party food with a cow So how you gonna keep him a farmer, always a jay farmer, always stay with the hay. He said, Mother Reuben, I'm not faking. Please don't think me strange. But when a woman and women make mischief with the boys, you have lots of spare chains. I said, so how you gonna keep them? sharecropping farms in the deep south. How are you going to keep them on those, those low, 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 you can't even call them low paying gigs of uh, jobs because for the most part by, well, at the end of a, a harvest season during Jim Crow, uh, a sharecropping farm, uh, one of the old jokes would be that the, the, the white owner would say to uh, the black family that was working his land, hey, we've had a pretty good year this year. You only owe me $25. You know? Because in a way it was kind of like credit cards because they didn't give them enough substance uh, to make it through the winter so they had to borrow and you have to borrow like that old song, 16 tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. And it would get gather interest. And they weren't given the market basket prices, you know. They, they were given the, the real, real highfalutin prices, you know. So, uh, anyhow. So these positive songs did stir up a lot of patriotism and uh, and, and people, uh, let's see, I, I do love th that quote, I have come from France more firmly convinced than ever that Negroes should write Negro music. We have our own racial feeling, and if we try to copy whites, we will make bad copies. We won France by playing music which was ours, and not a pale imitation of others. And if we are to develop in America, we must develop along with our own lines. James Reese 
Europe. All right. Uh, let's see, you can move it up a little bit. All right, yeah. And so I definitely encourage you, like this is like, this whole concert really is just like a little menu. Because I, I, if we are gonna be here all day, all weekend long, we could just really have a <coughs> wonderful time, you know? Pack a lunch, you know, and a couple of them. But I, I, I do encourage you, oh yeah. How much do we know about our black servicemen, the black, uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, on and on and on. I'll just uh, let you read that while I'm, I'm doing another song here for you. All right. Up to mighty London came an Irish man one day. It's the streets are paved with gold. Surely everyone was gay. Well. Back then, there was just a little different. Singing songs of Piccadilly, Strand and Lustre Stare. Tail, all Patty got excited. Then he shouted out to them there. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest little girl I know. started looking through Google and doing various search engines uh, for songs like these, the pro-war pro songs, basically. But I also wanted to see what the protest songs were. And there, there's, there's definitely some, but there's very, very few, and some were written quite a few years after World War I. Now, some of the exception to that are people that were more or less off the radar. So, blues musicians and jazz musicians fit right in there. So, uh, here's a little blues. It's a combination of a couple of different blues that go by the same name, Uncle Sam Blues. Well, let me 
touch of your pulse, man. What Uncle Sam has done to me. This one, Clara Smith. Whoa, let me tell you, post me. Whoa, Sammy has done to me. He took my husband, and that my good man. He came back, got my sweet old used to be. Sam so bad <clears throat> But it sure walks so doggone cute
there we go. Shades of Virginia last week, you know? You know, I don't, I don't believe in the concepts of the past, present, I'm not so sure about the future, but, uh, but I don't believe in concept of the, of the past, especially when the past keeps repeating itself, right? How could that be the past, right? You know, because when we think of the terms past, we, we instantly kind of compartmentalize it, right? Like, oh, well, that was then. And so often, like, if we have some kind of loss in our life or some kind of big dramatic change that's really uh, trying for us, uh, people, what do they say? Move on, right? Move on. That was the past, you know? You got you to gotta live in the moment. Well, if, the, if you're living in the moment, if you keep repeating the past, you know, and, 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 and we can see by those who control the history and how history is taught by, by controlling that, that they are controlling our present and most likely controlling our present, our, our future and our children's future and grandchildren's future. So uh, we got to get past this thing, that's the only thing to get past, is get past that concept to pass. It, we're on a continuum, all right? And what we didn't deal with, whether it was 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, or 400 years ago, is still till we get things right, and rectify, <coughs> and find reconciliation, it's never going to be America, the beautiful land of the free, home of the brave. As much as I love that dream, I, want, I don't want it to be a dream. I want it to be a reality. But that karma just keep, keeps coming back. And, and then most often it's used to divide us. So just some things to think about. And uh, so this progressive uh, President Wilson the very first movie that was ever showed in the White House was Birth of a Nation. And D.W. Griffin, and it was hailed as the, 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 the most genius cinematic uh, work of all time back then. And I guess on some kind of technical level, I guess there's some degree of truth in there. But what it, what it really did, how, how many of us have ever seen Birth of a Nation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's over three hours long. You can, you can uh, see it on uh, YouTube or Netflix or things like that. But what it really did was, sure, the North won the Civil War, but the South won the, the interpretation of what Reconstruction was. And Reconstruction was that time period that if that had really been realized, we would not, there would not have been the situations that we're in now. Uh, because what that movie did was, it said that it, it was the biggest propaganda movie of all time in my opinion. And uh, we can move on a little bit because there's, yeah, there's a, a protest of that, that movie. And uh, Woodrow Wilson was a Clance man. Uh, so was uh, Harry Truman, for that matter. But, but, he, but Harry uh, knew the buck stopped there. So uh, he, he, I think he was only a Clansman for a very little while. while Woodrow Wilson, even though he might have run away from uh, acknowledging his membership, he really uh, let, uh, he uh, resegregated, you know, it's just like if we'd had, just imagine if we had like this pretty progressive president, right? And then the next guy comes in and just says, well, well what did he do? Okay, well, I'm just going to do the opposite. I know that's hard to imagine. <laughs> but that's 
what Wilson did. He re-segregated a lot of the offices uh, of, the, of federal government jobs and stuff like that. And, and then he should make, the, Mr. President, remember the Constitution. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech of the press. Well, what do they think? You know, he was only saving us from them. Because, you know, I think this is the origins of fake news right here. <laughs> they were calling him on what he was doing. And newscasters and, and journalists by the hundreds were thrown in prison. And not only till the war was over, but uh, uh, for a long, for, some people were thrown in mental hospitals. You know, so it was, it was really desperate, you know. Uh, so, anyhow, let's go on one more. I'm having so much fun. Right. All right, so uh, he, he did that plan, that, that plan to uh, divide things up uh, with everybody. Plus, he did have that vision of, of a League of Nations that at least sounded good uh, idealistically, but he, he went on tour to try to sell it to America, and uh, he ran against uh, so much opposition that he got so frustrated, and he'd had a stroke. Uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with his judgment or not, but uh, when it finally came up for a vote, about after years of trying to sell the League of Nations, not only to the, you know, the pre-United Nations, right? The League of Nations, it, trying to not only sell it to American politicians, not only trying to sell this concept to the voters, he had to sell it to the world, right? And then everybody, uh, or a lot of people, the majority of the countries involved voted for it. And then he did everything in his power and he succeeded in not letting it pass in our own country. So it did not pass. He insisted to everybody, he pulled out every little chip that people owed him, you know? And so it's, I mean, it's totally, totally absurd. So, uh, let's see. So well, this is one, uh, this is one uh, that Memphis Slim wrote.
Jigo narcissistic personality disorders that crave of power insatiably. But I ain't gonna mention any names. <laughs> All right. No, you shouldn't. Sorry. Keep us guessing. All right. So there was all kinds of other music going on, like I said, throughout this country. Uh, ukulele craze was going on, jazz, and the banjo. Uh, this style of banjo, this is not a five-string banjo, this is a four-string banjo. And that was very, very, very uh, popular. And it still is, and especially in uh, New Orleans before the advent of the electric guitar, and with all those tubas and trombones and clarinets and loud trumpets, piano, drums, an acoustic guitar really didn't carry, carry um, very far. So more, more or less uh, the tenor four-string banjo was what was played a lot. And so uh, going back, dedicating this to the to the Harlem uh, Hellfighters. All right. Oh, yeah. Devastated by the Treaty of Versailles, U.S. isolationism, League of Nations, very weak, without, not without the, the U.S. to back things up. Great Britain and, and France want to avoid another ruinous war, but some W1, uh, World War I allies wanted more. Uh, Italy, I know, felt very bad that was left off the, uh, the spoils of war. And Jap Japan still won China, so yeah, so 
it was there in the mix. All the, all the seeds were planted. For, instead of the, the war to end all wars, it was really, really a war that just spread war seeds for even a, a worse war and, and more genocide of uh, the Holocaust and, 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 and many other things. And uh, to counter the opposition of the war at home, like I said, President Wilson pushed through Congress the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918 to suppress fake news. I mean, uh, uh, anti-British, British, pro-German, anti-war anti opinion. While he welcomed socialists who supported him in his war, he pushed at the same time to arrest and deport foreign-born radicals and he, he locked up a lot, a lot of U.S. citizens, that's for sure, uh, citing the Espionage Act. But like I said, this is a menu, and I just want you to check it out. So what did, so remember when I said that uh, uh, they were really afraid of, of African Americans coming back and expecting more from America? And they certainly did. And... Uh, and what happened were uh, some of the, uh, let's see, can you go back one? Oh, maybe two. There we go. Uh, one of the, uh, some of the Harlem Hellfighters them, themselves were dragged while wearing a uniform, dragged, it was either off a train or a bus by a white mob and, and, and lynched. And it's it just all over America, the amount of race riots perpetrated by whites on black communities, especially the more successful black communities, the more they got hit. Like Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, their black community was so successful, it was known as the Black Wall Street all across the United States. And there was usually some type of an excuse. You know, you know usually the, the excuse of uh, that uh, uh, a white woman had, had gotten raped or killed uh, or both. And, and so like one single act, if it even occurred, a lot of times those things were just propped up as rumors to instill vigilantism, right? And so uh, in Tulsa, that was one of the, the worst, worst. And there were survivors who said that the U.S. actually dropped bombs on the black community in Tulsa. Uh, so that's some things to think about. You can move on. And, uh, but finally, not till 1922, protests in front of the White House by children. These are the children of American political prisoners. Hundreds of union leaders, activists, and others were imprisoned under World War I and after, Espin under that Espionage and Sedition Acts. So free speech, you know, and like I said, hundreds of journalists and, uh, were thrown in too. So this is, this is really the origins, I, I mean that seriously, this is the origin of that concept of fake news. And leave it to me, trust me, because I can protect you from, from this. I'm the only one you can really trust, you know. And so, uh, let's see, unless there's any questions, uh, I'm, or comments, I'm going to, I'll play one more song, and, uh, and, and thank you very much for being such a, a wonderful, wonderful audience, definitely. Anybody have any comments or questions? With me? <laughs> Half the time I don't agree with myself. <laughs> This is a, this guy wasn't a Harlem Hellfighter that I know of. His name was John Bray, and 
He worked as a leader of a crew that hauled cypress logs from Louisiana swamps. He was recorded by the late John Lomax, the same guy that uh, ethnomusicologists are just, man, just wonderful, him and his son. I knew his son, I met him at least. Uh, we were on a panel together in Memphis about 20 years ago, uh, Alan Lomax. And he was near uh, John Bray, the writer of this song, was uh, uh, living near, uh, John Lomax found him near Morgan City. Anyhow, uh, uh, this is a song called Trenches Blues. And this, uh, this, this is really a war of trench warfare, that's for sure, hand-to-hand -hand combat and a lot, a lot of artillery and, and of course, uh, the gas, uh, uh, it just made it such a horrific, horrific war. But this is his trench blues. They said no comprehend 
that whistle. Big Bear Sadly Tones. Lord have mercy, soldier. So many dead and gone. of the world is more knowledge out there and uh, obtainable you know so just you know get out there and, and mix it up and and, uh, and check it out uh, I found all of this out basically from doing that also I really want to recommend the PBS American Experience uh, program that they did on World War One it's only available it's at your library. Uh, it's at your library. Isn't that good? That is. That is true. Ch check. Ch check that out. That is all the top topics of, 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 to a far greater depth are uh, really explored there. So thanks, CJ. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Just leave them on the table. That would be much appreciated. Thanks.